Welcome to POTUS 2017, where we keep watch on the Oval Office and pour cold hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. I'm Brian Lehrer. Today, the impact of the Trump administration on America so far and long term. Plus, in our evidence-based politics segment, at the rising number of marches and rallies, who exactly is protesting against Trump and what issues bring them out? Let's get right to it with our first round table of guests, all of them veterans here. We rely on Catherine Colbert to keep an eye on the Jeff Sessions Justice Department and the Supreme Court, especially issues that confront women. She directs the Athena Center for Leadership Studies at Barnard College and has defended Roe versus Wade before the high court. Greg David follows the money for us. This includes jobs, trade, the Fed, and the fate of your mortgage deduction. Greg directs the Business and Economics Reporting Program at the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism and is a columnist for Crane's New York Business. Journalist and lawyer Raul Reyes is back with us too. He has reported from the southern border to northern boardrooms and has been a contributor to Politico, MSNBC, Hispanic Magazine, <laughs> even the failing New York Times. We'll get Raul's take on a range of issues, including the dreamers who are on thin ice and that sheriff who, pardon this, sees himself as part of ICE, that's the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Bureau. Welcome all. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, Greg, I'll start with you. Is there a Trump effect on the economy seven months in, or is it too early to see one? No, I think there is a Trump effect on the economy. Let's start with the fact he inherited a very good economy. He Great job creation, declining unemployment rate, uh, good position for corporations, but the stock market soared after his uh, election, by the time we thought it was actually going to decline, primarily because of expectations on the part of corporate America that he would be able to deliver things they wanted, in particular tax reform that would reduce corporate taxes. Um, and the market hasn't faltered in believing something's good's going on, despite all that's happened. Now, in addition to that, Jobs have continued to grow. Unemployment has continued to decline. And corporate profits are very strong, and that's helping to support this very high level of the market. So yes, there is a short-term effect of Trump on the economy. And how about immigration? For all the talk mm -hmm. of immigration, how about an actual effect on immigrants living in the United States, immigration policy? Is it mostly talk, or are people feeling it? Well, in, in terms of what people are feeling, uh, it, it's hard to overstate the amount of fear and anxiety among the immigrant community and even within the broader Latino community overall because so many people come from mixed status families where maybe the, the parents are undocumented but their children are, are U.S. citizens. So that's true. we see tremendous fear and anxiety there. When you look at the actual levels of illegal immigration, they have shown a, a drop off, but those are very long term trends. So it's too early to tell if that's really a result of Trump's rhetoric. One thing that so far, because it's early in the year that we haven't seen, all this might surprise people, that uh, Trump's de level of deportation so far at, compared to a, a similar period last year, they are not higher than the previous administration. And mm. that's because there's so much, such a tremendous backlog in our immigration courts. Not that these deportations will not take place and that the deportation uh, force is not unleashed, but it's really a, a backlog in the courts that we haven't seen the record number of removals yet. Just to follow up on illegal border crossings being down, right. Trump touts that as, you know, a result of his tough talk. People right, are intimidated. Right. They're not trying to cross illegally as much. Fair enough. Right. That's what he says. But you have to remember, illegal uh, border crossings tend to go down during the winter, during this exact time of year, every year. That's just a, a seasonal thing. And to re we really have to wait, I think, longer to see if his rhetoric has influenced the data. They, he, I mean, it's an arguable point, but mm -hmm. it's not yet conclusively shown maybe, by the data. Maybe right. the summer numbers aren't in yet. It, right. Uh, well, Kitty, maybe this is, this is where, you know, immigration and the rule of law meet. It's the Joe Arpaio mm. pardon. 
yep. which is both an immigration issue and a rule of law issue. What's the big picture? Well, the big picture on, on, on the legal front is the appointment of Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. And mm -hmm. that is a, a considerable achievement for the right. It's what they have, uh, why they support uh, the, the Republican Party, and they're very happy with Gorsuch as a, as a pick. And he will continue the tradition of, of uh, Scalia and be a very, very firm uh, right-wing vote on the court. But in a way, that's the most normal thing that has happened, maybe in the entire Trump administration. <laughs> That's it, absolutely. George Bush would have picked a person like that. Jeb Bush probably would have picked a person That's, like that. That's absolutely correct. The more significant question on the rule of law and the pardon and all of these other issues are, are twofold. One is what Jeff Sessions is doing as the Attorney General. And while lots of attention is on Trump, very little attention has been paid to the many, many changes that our Attorney General has already implemented on such things as immigration, affirmative action, uh, criminal justice reform, questions of voting rights. He's made major changes from the Obama administration in all of those areas. And the Supreme Court this term faces a really, uh, a lot of very, very interesting cases that will allow the Solicitor General and the Justice Department to come in with very conservative positions and possibly influence the court. Maybe pick one of those and give us some detail about a change that's taken place that's been a little bit under the radar. Well, uh, for example, uh, the criminal justice reform area. Mm -hmm. We were moving very closely to the right and the left actually coming together on reducing uh, the number of people in prisons, uh, eliminating private prisons. For one of the first things that Jeff Sessions did is he uh, withdrew uh, the order that said uh, they're no longer going to use private prisons, re-implemented that use. Uh, he urged prosecutors across the Justice Department to seek the, the highest uh, crime that one can be prosecuted for instead of leaving it to the discretion of the prosecutor at local areas. He has reestablished the war on drugs. Mm -hmm. He's changed the relationship between the states around medical marijuana and legalized marijuana. So there's lots of things that have undermined uh, the, the direction we are moving under Obama and that and, make a and difference. Just, and just this week he opened the spigot again, I gather, to military equipment flowing to local police departments, Absolutely. which Obama had turned off. You're a lawyer. Raul, you want to get in on this at all? Well, well I think something else that, that is notable is that, you remember in the Obama administration, he created the DACA program for the Dreamers, the young people who were brought here illegally by their parents, and they, they, and they also created DAPA, which they defended in court, and ultimately it did not go into effect. That was for the parents of the Dreamers. Right, for their parents. Right now, with the threat of a lawsuit from Texas and several other states, it, we don't know for sure, but it appears very likely that the Trump administration is going to switch sides in a, in a sense and, and, and say that their Department of Justice will not defend DACA, meaning that the program will end and all those young people will be eligible, will be at risk for deportation like anyone else. So that's a switch going. 800,000 young adults. Exactly. And we're, we're supposed to know by Tuesday, the day after Labor Day. Right. I, we, we, that's the deadline for that the states have given them to file the lawsuit if he hasn't acted. acted. Yeah. If, if the prior uh, actions are any indication, it might come, say, on a Friday night, because that's when this White House likes to throw out a huge uh, news dump of information. Yeah. Let's, um, let's come back to the economy. And I want to play a clip of Trump during the campaign talking about the economy, and in particular, the Federal Reserve Board. Watch this. Well, I believe the Fed is very political. It's become very political, like many other groups in this country, beyond anything I would have ever thought possible. And so I think you're going to have low interest rates uh, till the end of the year, maybe no increase at all. And the market will stay artificially high. And then we're going to have to see what happens after that. But I think it's, uh, they're, not, they're not doing the right job. So that's interesting that he called the markets artificially high last year on, as a result of the Fed, uh, what, pumping stimulus into the economy. And Janet Yellen, just the other day, the chair of the Fed, uh, defended her policy publicly. And of course, this is a policy that goes back to Ben Bernanke before her. Um, is, this, is this Janet Yellen playing politics to try to stave off something that Trump might do? Well, let's start with the fact that Trump withdrew most of what he said because he spent the, then he spent a couple months praising Janet Yellen and saying he might reappoint her as Fed chair. That's a five-year term, and it comes up right. next February. Right. right, he has to decide something by February. 
Um, the, um, he wants low interest rates. Now he says absolutely he wants no low interest. And by the way, the market's high because of him now, not because of some artificial stimulus. Right. Um, so he has to decide. It's generally thought that he could appoint, reappoint Yellen, although more likely, um, if he's not too angry with him, Gary Cohn, his top economic advisor, is believed to be in line to the Fed. But since he threatened to quit, we don't know where he stands with Trump these Over days. Over Charlottesville. Over Charlottesville. Um, here's what we should say about that. There's going to be a new chairperson at the Fed. The interest rate policies are probably not going to change because as the economy gets better, the Fed will increase interest rates and unwind the stimulus. I think there's like universal consensus that's what anyone would do. What Yellen actually did in Jackson Hole, Wyoming last week is she defended the regulatory steps that the Fed and Congress had taken to restrain Wall Street in the aftermath of the financial crisis. Mm. This is important because that's what <laughs> Trump and the Republicans want to change. He has appointed someone to the Fed who will be in charge of regulations, who believes they need to be um, reduced and weakened. So that's sort of where the rubber will hit the road in the appointment of the Fed and in Congress if it can muster the energy to deal with the issues. Um, very briefly, before we go on to our next segment, we're talking about all these nice policies. Um, there's also the elephant in the room, which is, you know, you have the former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, saying Trump is not equipped to be president. You have Bob Corker, the Republican chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, a Trump ally in a lot of policies, questioning his stability and competence to be president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, this is practically an emergency at the level of presidential ability to yes. do his job. When I look at it, uh, probably the kindest thing I could say about this president uh, is that he is erratic, which is not a good quality. In, 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 our, in our leader, you know, you know, when you look at his actions, when you look at things, things that are not, not uh, disputed, you know, he's an impulsive person, he, he's an erratic person, he's very uh, unpredictable, he holds grudges, he's vindictive. These are, factual, th these are factual matters. Those are not the qualities we need in any president, no matter what their party affiliation. So I think when we hear people talking increasingly and wondering, is this president disturbed? I mean, I think there is a legitimate case to be made there based on his actions and his his known personal history. Kitty, how does this intersect with policy? Well, I think the, the key question here is when is the Republican Party as a whole and when are Republicans gonna, gonna have that same point of view? Uh, because I, I think in we're- In public. In public and willing to take him on. And after Charlottesville, you saw a little bit of that. Uh, not enough, in right. my view, but certainly a little bit of it. Certain, the Secretary of State willing to distance himself a bit. Uh, Gary Cohn willing to distance himself a bit, but it's really too little, yeah. too late. And until, frankly, the uh, Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell are willing to take him on and forego what they see to be a Republican win, uh, because he will sign what they pass, uh, you're going to see uh, this continue. But Greg, I think there are two separate things here. I don't think the the mainstream Republicans will ever really throw him overboard, meaning impeach or something like that, um, over moral outrage, over things like Charlottesville and Joe Arpaio. Only, I think, if they see a threat to the nation in the way that James Clapper was putting it or stability like Corker was putting it, because they don't care enough ultimately about the, the bigotry issues and things like that. Well, let, me, let me take one step back. It may not be a threat to the nation. Um, it may be a threat to the survival of the Republican Party. And that would be if they become convinced that the 2018 elections will be one of those transformative elections that changes the political map. And on the way to that decision, what you could get, the Republicans go along with this because they believe that Trump is the way their agenda will get enacted. But with the failure of health care, 
with no progress on tax reform. He's out in Missouri talking about tax reform with not a plan. We don't know what he will propose. With very difficult decisions looming on raising the debt ceiling and keeping the government open, um, you could get to this place before they decide the Republican, the nation is at risk, just that the Republicans are at risk. Greg David, thank you. Kitty and Raul, you're staying with us as we bring on some additional evidence on the resistance to Trump. Stay with us. for evidence-based politics, where we pour cold, hard facts on the overheated political rhetoric. In the early hours of November 9th, 2016, when the final vote had started to sink in and it was clear that Donald Trump would be the next president of the United States, protests erupted, even before dawn in some places. By evening, cities across the U.S. were alive with dissent. Trump's first full day on the job was colored by a sea of pink hats when millions around the world took part in women's marches. And protests have continued on issues including climate change and immigration. Columbia University sociologist Todd Gitlin, author of a dozen books that range from the new left of the 60s to the Occupy Wall Street movement, is encouraged by the resistance to Trump, but worried about the militant anti-fascist, the so-called Antifa. Here via Skype are 30 seconds of his thoughts on protest. It looks to me as though a lot of the right things are being done. Voters are being registered. Uh, people are turning out. Obviously, people turned out for the town meetings that uh, helped stop the nonsensical, spurious health care reform in its tracks. Uh, all that. So all that is, I think, extremely positive. The scientists' uh, mobilization, which is unprecedented, another happy sign. Um, so all that has sprung into being with, uh, you know, with alacrity and with, I think, uh, uh, surprising tenacity. Now, against all that, the, the Antifa um, extremity, its numbers are generally small, but a few people in Berkeley, I think something like five people jumped some uh, people they didn't like and they got their pictures all over the papers. Um, so uh, you, you, you leverage your, your relatively small numbers by showing up in your balaclavas, your black mass, and so on. Um, and so you hijack the event and uh, you're off to the races. You feel like the winners, you feel like the leaders, you feel like the vanguard. None of that has to do with how you're actually seen, uh, what kinds of impact you have, what kind of reverberations you have in a larger world. Todd Gitlin predicts the anti-fascists could well end up blamed for deadly armed confrontations, especially in so-called right-to-carry states. Those are gun laws. But as he said, the Antifa are a fringe few. So what does 99% of the resistance look like? Using extensive surveys, one researcher finds that new people are protesting, and for many reasons. Joining us via Skype, Dana Fisher, professor of sociology at the University of Maryland, College Park. She's in Sweden on sabbatical. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. Also with us for this segment on protest, Bob Master, one of the founders of the Working Families Party of New York. He oversees its national organizing effort. And still at their posts, Catherine Colbert and Raul Reyes. All right, Professor Fisher, fill us in. Uh, many more protesters than you are used to seeing in Washington, D.C.? Well, certainly in the past seven years since I moved down, actually, I used to be Todd's col uh, colleague up at Columbia. Since I moved down to Washington, D.C., there was a lull during the Obama administration where there weren't so many large-scale protest events. Since the inauguration and the Women's March, protests has exploded not only in Washington, D.C., but all over the country, as you well know. So we've seen a lot more people out there. And I, I survey protesters, so I can tell you a lot about who's been participating. 
What we found, which is remarkable, is the percentage of the people who come out for these large-scale events who are new to protest. 33% of the people at the Women's March had never been to a protest before in their lives. At the March for Science, which was in April, it was about a third, slightly less than the March for Science. And then at the People's Climate March, a week following that, it went down a little bit, it was 25%. But the other thing that we actually found is we asked the people who participated if they had participated in the Women's March and if they had participated in the March for Science. And what we found was that these are repeat protesters. These people are coming back again. They're new, but they're getting engaged and they're staying engaged. So this isn't just a one-off armchair activist who wants to wear a pussy hat once. I'm curious if you study if street protests in particular accomplish anything. Well, it accomplishes getting attention, although certainly the Antifa has hijacked the media coverage of late. Um, but it gets a lot of attention. It shows collective action. It shows a collective identity in the streets. And it doesn't just mobilize people to march on one day. What we're seeing is that those people are also participating by calling their representatives, going to town hall meetings, showing up and staying involved and paying attention. Bob, what has been effective or ineffective in the resistance as you see it? Well, I think the resistance has uh, been remarkable, has really, in, in a sense, outperformed anything that uh, most of us anticipated. If you had asked me on Inauguration Day whether or not we had a chance of defeating uh, the repeal of Obamacare, I would have said, we're, we're, we're sunk here. Be, you know, the, the Republicans have to hold to their promise. And I think the mobilizations uh, that have been described contributed to an overall resistance that uh, had a huge impact and engaged many, many new people uh, to resist. Although that's not what brought people out into the streets, uh, resistance to repealing Obamacare, I guess it did bring them to congressional town halls. And I think it's all of a piece. I mean, I think there's a, a, a kind of a galvanizing, massive social resistance to much of what Trump uh, has proposed. Um, is the Democratic Party part of the resistance? Uh, back on its heels because of the resistance. Where does the Democratic Party world fit in? They are part of this resistance, but they are not leading it. This is the res resistance as we know it now. It's a grassroots effort. It's coming from, from you know, very young people. It's coming from people who are uh, in the disabled community. It's coming from people on the ground. So they're part of it, but they're not at the forefront. And what has been interesting to me covering these many marches we've seen all around the country is the intersectionality that we see, for example, at, an, at a uh, march in, in uh, protecting immigrants' rights. You now see the LGBTQ com community resented, you, uh, you represented. You see people in uh, who believe in, in climate science and, and climate change and things like that. So you see many more groups coming together across uh, ethnic affiliations, across, you know, uh, uh, you know, also promoting issues concerning gender, and other, other forms of discrimination, all united. Um, professor, are you concerned that there's this Trump-Bannon strategy where they do something really culturally polarizing to bait the left. The left overreacts, either the violent Antifa fringe or just politically and in speech, and Trump wins. I don't see any, any situation where Trump wins out of this because every time that the administration takes an outrageous stand and motivates what we think of as moral outrage, more people go in the streets. And the thing about it is the more people who are participating in the streets, the more people who are actually available and making themselves engaged in these other forms of action. I actually just, since we actually study the motivations that bring people out into the streets, we actually can chronicle and have written about the intersectionality of the crowds, which we see across the entirety of the resistance. But we also see the reason that people actually came out the day after the, the inauguration, specifically because they were worried about health care. So that issue inspired people to get involved in the beginning. And then the activities that were taking place on the Hill and what the administration was doing was motivating them to get even more involved. Bob, same question. Yeah, I, look, I think that you always have different uh, tendencies within mass movements. I mean, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, there were fringe elements like the Weather Underground and so on and so forth. Um, and we need to separate that out. I think there is a, a level of resistance that is far more important than these fringe elements. Um, and, and frankly, you know, the real fringe elements are on their side. I and mean, we're talking about neo-Nazis and white supremacists. And we are not going to be in a position to tell 
uh, militant people uh, on the left, uh, communities of color, that they need to mute their voices. I mean, I think in response to the question that you asked earlier to Raul, I, you know, the Democratic Party is racing to play catch up. I mean, if you remember in the first couple of weeks, we're going to work with him on this, we're going to work with mm -hmm. him on that, and the resistance really s stiffened their spines. And, and you come from a third party Correct. that tries to influence the Democratic Party from the left. Right. Does it mean the time is ripe for a more active third party movement in America or not really? Well, I want to be clear because we're not a third party in the conventional sense that people think of the Greens and Ralph Nader spoiling the election. I mean, the greatest achievement of the Green Party was electing George Bush president and, and you, know, pr you know, providing us with the basis for the Iraq war and, and, uh, and the biggest tax cut in history. We are a third party that operates inside and outside the Democratic Party. We, we try to form an independent organization with a clear program a multiracial progressive populist program that pushes the Democrats, but we avoid spoiling because we understand what the stakes are and we see it with Trump. Kitty, are the intelligence community and the judicial branch of government kind of reluctant members of the resistance because Trump is threatening the balance of power in our democracy? Well, I think what's really interesting is not only do we see resistance on the streets, but we see resistance in the courts. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot, remember, the immigration ban was stopped in the courts, and we, mm -hmm. we see the importance of the judiciary and the uh, importance of the legal community in standing up to a lot of the policy initiatives that have gone forward. And I think that's really an important part of this. It's not the only story, but it's certainly an, an important one, and it, they, they feed off of each other. The more wins we have in the courts, frankly, the more the resistance is doing its job. And I think that what we have to remember is the people who are our judges are human beings, are people who respond to the, the, the activity and the messages in the world. And so the more the, there is resistance, the more legitimate resistance is, the more likely we're going to see wins in the courts. And I think that's a very good thing. Bob, what happens in the next six months? Well, you know, in, in 1965, Baird Rustin wrote an article in commentary, he said we have to go from protest to politics. And he was really talking about the 1963 March on Washington mm -hmm. movement. And I think the challenge uh, for progressives, for populists, for the left, is to go from protest to politics and to convert this energy. And look, we saw, we saw in the Bernie campaign, not perfectly, uh, the, the forerunner of what we really need. Thank you all very much for joining us. And that's POTUS 2017 for today. For the next few weeks, we'll be airing the best of POTUS 2017, which is an upbeat way of saying some repeats are coming your way. <laughs> I wish the nation would change fast enough for the better to make those recent programs irrelevant. No such luck, probably. And do watch this space for brand new programming in the fall. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for being there.